Good morning, everybody. Thank you for uh, being here today. We're, we're here to talk about some of the successes that uh, the department and our state and local partners have had in our expanding uh, efforts to combat the use of fraudulent schemes that prey upon senior citizens. I want to thank Associate Deputy Attorney General Tony Bacon, who is the department's coordinator for elder justice, Deputy FBI Director Bowditch, Secret Service Director Alice, FTC Chairman Simons, Chief Postal Inspector Barksdale, HSI Executive Associate Director Benner, Attorney General Landry of Louisiana, and Attorney General Peterson of Nebraska, and all the state and local law enforcement partners who are here today. We're especially honored to have as our special guest Judge uh, Bill Webster and his wife, Linda. All of you know uh, Judge Webster has had a storied career in public service. He served as United States Attorney, a federal district court judge, a federal circuit court judge, and he's the only American uh, to have served and led the FBI uh, and the CIA. Uh, I've been friends with Bill and Linda for decades, uh, and I was thinking back, Judge, and I think I met you when you first came into Washington to head the FBI, and I was clerking for your old friend Malcolm Wilkie was introduced to you and we uh, worked together when I was first at the department and Judge Webster was head of the CIA and I want to uh, wish him happy birthday yesterday was his 95th birthday <clears throat> and he's still doing public service because in a few minutes Bill and Linda uh, are going to tell us uh, about uh, attempts that were made to defraud them by scammers overseas. Uh, but they picked the wrong people because working with uh, law, law enforcement, those, uh, the, the Websters were able to uh, get these people arrested and they're currently behind bars. Uh, just before this news conference, uh, the Websters and I met with a number of local law enforcement leaders who uh, are on the front lines of dealing with this problem of uh, fraud against elders. And it really drove home how devastating uh, these crimes are for the, for the victims involved. I, I myself was involved not as a victim, but as a lure, if, if you can believe that. Two years ago, my official Justice Department portrait from 1992 was put all over the, uh, the internet on various websites where I was informing people that as the former Attorney General I had special access to government grants and uh, that if people sent me money I would tell them how to get a lot of money. And I started receiving calls from people asking me where the money was and actually the local ABC News channel broke, broke this, the case and, and found out uh, that this was being done and helped me take this down from Facebook. But my my uh, picture kept on appearing, and I continued to get calls at my law office. And these were very desperate calls. Some of the people were obviously desperately hoping that this was not a scam, and they were inquiring about my ability to fulfill my promises of sending them money. And others called. They were embarrassed. Uh, but they wanted to let me know that uh, this was going on, and they wanted to ask how they could uh, who they should talk to about it. And I remember some of the calls. I remember a woman from Georgia. They had lost their life savings, $40,000. This is a particularly despicable crime because uh, and it's a massive and growing problem. And it's, and it's despicable because the people involved are, are vulnerable. And because of their stage in life, they don't have the opportunity frequently to recover. And so these losses are devastating to them. Uh, we have to prosecute an all-out attack on this kind of crime. Last year, the department conducted a record-breaking sweep of fraudsters who had targeted the elder, elderly. And in a few minutes, uh, Tony is going to announce the results of this year's sweep. And everyone standing behind me uh, was involved. I'm happy to say that all the U.S. Attorney's offices participated in one form or another, as did thousands of state and local law enforcement personnel around the country, and they should take 
great pride in the results that Tony is going to be discussing. And I want to applaud Attorney General Sessions for making this a priority. And as long as I'm Attorney General, it will be a priority. And I uh, promise that I will be ratcheting up these efforts. Later today, I'm going to convene a meeting with some of the leaders of the telecommunications industry, uh, including representatives from Apple, Microsoft, AT&T, and Google. And I'm hopeful that the meeting will help us work together to protect these, these victims. And now I'd like to welcome to the podium uh, Judge and Linda Webster. Linda. Oops. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Good morning, everyone. As uh, announced, my name is Linda Webster, and my husband, William Webster, and I were indeed targeted but for, for many, on, on many occasions by elder fraud scammers. They first attempted to extort millions of dollars from us uh, over the course of several years. In June, 19, or in June 2014, my husband received a phone call from someone claiming to be the head of a mega millions lottery. The gentleman proceeded to congratulate him on receiving uh, this great amount of money, but first needed uh, a little payment of, from Bill uh, in order to receive his $15.5 million door prize or cash prize. The catch was Bill needed to send him $50,000 in cash f to pay the taxes on, on the lottery winnings. Well, given that both my husband and I are over 60, we get these calls quite frequently, and usually they're harmless. Uh, quite often, I'll listen to my husband speaking, and I'll get on the phone and start being a little nasty myself. Um, <laughs> they don't like dealing with me, and usually they stop calling. Uh, but in this case, back in 20, uh, 2014, uh, a scammer that called himself David, uh, later with a, a name I won't mention because I don't want to give him the notoriety, uh, he then said that, uh, when I got on the phone, he basically said that uh, he was going to kill me. He proceeded to describe what my blood would look like on my white house uh, when my head was shot off. Uh, he also seemed to know that we'd been out the night before, and when I got nastier and nastier, he then threatened to burn down our house and kill us both. So uh, I do know a little bit about law enforcement, thanks to this one, and I, I did file a police report, and I called our friends at the FBI. Uh, who uh, quickly uh, responded. I think they were a little un upset that somebody would try to defraud their director. But anyway, uh, the vile, ho horrible calls continued, but the good thing in this case is the FBI gave us a burn phone, so we were able to capture the conversations. The conversations to Bill were all sweetness and lightness, and uh, Bill played with them and, 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 and talked to him, uh, got him uh, to think that perhaps we were going to go along with the scheme. And then I got on the phone and did the same, but I did, we both did make it very clear that we were going to, uh, that we made it very clear that he indeed was the former FBI and CIA director. So that's, that's what was really interesting. The man continued to think that he was uh, gonna get money from my husband. So uh, to shorten the story, the FBI did a wonderful job in, in finding out who this man was. He was uh, in Jamaica. And uh, we waited for him to make a trip to the United States, uh, which he did in December of 2016. Uh, he told the judge a few weeks ago that he was there to shop for toys for his children. Um, I don't think she believed him, and she um, sentenced him to almost six years in prison. So our message, and the reason we're here today, is that anyone, absolutely anybody, can be targeted by the scammers, many of whom seem legitimate, friendly, like your next door neighbor. Our message is don't be fooled. Fortunately, through the hard work of the men and women standing behind us and at the FBI and Department of Justice, our case went to court and our scammer is in jail. The other message we'd like to convey is this group of people and others are not finished. They're working hard to catch more of these scammers. And so if you're in Jamaica or any of these other countries, we're not done. And I'm also here just to say, sadly, anyone can be a victim of fraud, and that I hope that the women and women who are younger, you keep a vigilant eye on grandma and grandpa. Take a, take, watch what mom and dad are doing. Uh, 
don't have to be a spy necessarily, do we? But <laughs> keep an eye. So the last question uh, that we often get is, what do we do if we're being frauded? I'd like to report that uh, the FBI does have a, a website uh, for those who are web savvy. It's called uh, www.ic3.gov. There's also uh, the FTC has a Consumer Sentinel helpline. Number is 81-877-701-9595. Or you can always call our friends at the FBI at 1-800-CALL-FBI. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Linda. I'm Bill Webster, and uh, the Attorney General was kind enough to mention my previous experiences in law enforcement and the bench. I can't add, <clears throat> can't add too much to what Linda has said, except that I am, as of, particularly as of yesterday, intensely conscious on what it means to be older and to be potentially a victim uh, and dealing with not wanting. Uh, I feel so sorry for older people who get this good news of the money they've won, and they are terribly going to be terribly disappointed, but they don't want to believe anything, uh, or they don't know how to deal with it if they are uncertain as to the legitimacy of it. Uh, this is a growing problem. I know in the, in the case that we've just described to you, uh, the man that is on his way to prison for, for a substantial amount of time uh, was uh, uh, from Jamaica, and it uh, took four years of solid waiting and watching before he got within our jurisdiction, and the FBI took over and did a beautiful job. Older people are uncertain about taking these matters in their own hands, wish it were true that they were winning money and other kinds of successes. So I think it's important to uh, let them know there are ways in which they can check out these calls and should. And that these, the, uh, the more we allow them to know where they can check out these calls, because there are lots of money involved in this now, lots of money in this one case that we described, hundreds of thousands of dollars paid out in the hope that they'd we're going to get even more money back by being older and somehow saying, see what I can do. In any event, uh, it's a privilege to be here. I congratulate the Attorney General for the support that he's given. Uh, our, elder, our elder fellow citizens deserve our support and our protection. And we're going to do everything we can to be sure that they're not defrauded and that they are protected. Thank you. Good morning. As General Barr mentioned, I'm Tony Bacon, and I'm the department's National Elder Justice Coordinator. Last year, the department announced the largest enforcement action for elder fraud in our nation's history. The sweep included charges against more than 200 defendants for elder fraud schemes and dozens of civil actions. The defendants in those cases defrauded more than one million Americans of more than half a billion dollars. Those were laudable accomplishments. But as criminals are relentlessly targeting our nation's seniors, trying to scam and swindle and cheat them out of their life savings, we at the department challenged ourselves to do more. It's fitting that today, during National Consumer Protection Week, I'm announcing the results of this year's elder fraud sweep, and they're bigger than last. The sweep this year it involves charges against more than 260 defendants who allegedly defrauded more than 2 million Americans of more than three quarters of a billion dollars. That's 13% more criminal defendants, 28% more in losses, and double the number of fraud victims than last year's record-breaking sweep. This sweep is not only the largest in scale, but the largest in geography as well. 
we worked with a larger coalition of law enforcement partners and reached a broader area, not only of our country, but of the planet than ever before. And while this sweep covers all elder fraud cases, we had a particular focus this year on tech support scams. So in 2018, the FTC's Consumer Sentinel database received more than 142,000, 142,000 complaints of attempted tech support fraud. Seniors, those are consumers age 60 and older, reported more loss reports on tech support scams from 2015 to 2018 than any other type of fraud scheme. For those of you who aren't familiar with tech support scams, here's how they work in a nutshell. The criminal pretends to work for a big tech company like Microsoft or Apple, and typically the fraudster will claim that the victim's computer has a virus or it's been hacked. But don't worry, they'll fix it for a fee and for access to the victim's computer. And we all know what happens next. Lies like these have cost seniors their life savings. The department has not and will not stand for this type of exploitation. Many components joined together to investigate and prosecute the tech support schemes as part of this sweep. The Civil Division's Consumer Protection Branch, the Criminal Division's Computer Crimes and Intellectual Property Section, and 10 different U.S. Attorney's Office filed criminal or civil charges against over 30 defendants following investigations led by the FBI and our partners at the Postal Inspection Service and Homeland Security Investigations. I would like to really compliment our colleagues at the Postal Inspection Service who were able to stop many of these payments before they left our country and reached the criminals overseas. Speaking of overseas, a number of these cases involved call centers located in India. Allegedly, they defrauded tens of thousands of American victims. Indian law enforcement has been cooperative with our efforts, and the department is truly grateful for their attempts to crack down on these fraudulent call centers. As many of these cases original, originate overseas, we had a second focus for this sweep, and that's on money mules. Now, some of you might not be familiar with the term money mules. These are Americans who are laundering money from American victims, often seniors, to the criminal fraudsters located overseas. Some of these money mules know gosh darn well what they're doing. They're co-conspirators. But sometimes they're innocent people. They're tricked into thinking that they're working for a legitimate business, but really they're working for fraudsters. Over the past five months, we've identified hundreds of these money mules across America. We identified which ones are knowing and willful conspirators, and in those cases, we are taking them to court. We've also identified those who were tricked, who didn't know that they were working with the fraudsters. In those cases, we're finding them, we're educating them, and we're asking them to sign a letter promising to stop. Since October 1st, under the leadership of the Consumer Protection Branch, the FBI and our partners at the Postal Inspection Service have stopped more than 600, 600 money mules across 65 different federal districts. They involve participants in a wide variety of schemes, from the lottery schemes to grant parent scams to IRS imposters, and yes, to tech support. The department is prosecuting these schemes like never before, but we realize we can't prosecute our way out of this problem. We need to do more. We need to stop. We need to prevent this from happening. And that's why we must focus on educating the public about these threats. Our elder justice coordinators across the U.S. Attorney's Office community, the FBI, the FTC, our friends at the State Attorney's General's Office and Senior Corps have done absolutely outstanding work toward that end. And I'd like to thank each and every one of them for their efforts. Seniors across America today can be assured they are safer because of this operation. Fraudsters both here and abroad can be certain that our efforts will continue. We are becoming more effective. We are becoming more sophisticated and better coordinated than ever before in disrupting these schemes here and abroad. 
We are absolutely committed to bringing criminals to justice and most importantly, to giving American seniors peace of mind. I would now like to invite FTC Chairman Joe Simons to the podium. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Protecting older adults in the marketplace has been a top FTC priority for decades. I am delighted to join our partners in this coordinated strike against tech support scams and other frauds. The FTC brings several tools to the table. We bring law enforcement, we bring education, and we bring data analysis. Last week, a federal court in Utah granted our request to stop an alleged tech support scam run by a company called Elite IT. We charge that the defendants duped consumers many of whom were older Americans, into giving them access to their computers, into believing that the computers were infected or needed repair, and into buying $10 million of unnecessary software and services. The court's temporary restraining order freezes the defendant's assets so that, potentially, we can return money to victims at the end of the case. This case is just one of many that we have brought over the years against tech support scammers, and we are determined to continue to fight these fraudsters, whether in the U.S. or abroad. Today, we also release new education materials that show how tech support scams work and what consumers can do about them. For example, hang up on an unexpected call from someone who claims to be providing tech support. Just hang up. It's a scam. Our materials, which include a new video with an older American first-hand account of the scam can be found at ftc.gov backslash tech support scams. We also want to spotlight some critical consumer complaint data from the FTC's Consumer Sentinel Network database. People 60 years and older are great at spotting fraud and reporting it, and they are typically less likely than young people to lose money in these things. This is not the case, however, with respect to tech support scams. In 2018, people 60 and older were about five times more likely to report losing money from a tech support scam uh, than young people, and the reported loss, median loss, was $500. The FTC is committed to protecting older adults, and I look forward to continuing our joint work to ensure that all consumers are protected in a safe, competitive marketplace. Thank you all, and thank you, oh, he's not here anymore. Thank you, Attorney General Barr and the rest of the folks at the Justice Department, Tony and uh, others. Thank you. Well, good morning. I'd like, again, to thank General Barr, uh, Chairman Simons, for your commitment to fighting elderly fraud, and specifically tech scams that affect the elderly. As chief legal officers of our state, General, Pe uh, General Peterson and the Ag Consumer Protection Committee co-chair and I work daily to protect our constituents from fraudsters, and we recognize how critical consumer education is in preventing scams. Last year, over six in 10 consumers experienced tech support scams. Today's announcement hopefully will go a long way to improving that statistic. It certainly is a testament to our partnership at the federal, state, and local levels. So I want to be sure to thank President Trump and his administration for their support in this endeavor. I also encourage everyone to visit consumerresources.org, a new website launched by the National Association of Attorney Generals. Consumerresource.org has plenty of tips and tools to help keep the public safe from fraud. Attorneys generals from our states and territories will continue to educate, investigate, and litigate. We will keep doing all we can to fight scam artists and to protect consumers. Again, I want to thank General Barr and his commitment uh, to ensuring that we go out and protect our seniors from these types of scams. Thank you. We've seen examples of the pop-ups, but how do they get into a victim's computer in the first place? And secondly, 
do they actually freeze the computer or uh, do they do anything to the computer before the person responds? One way they get into the victim's computer is they have the victim on the phone or will ask the victim to engage in a series of keystrokes so that they can essentially remote log in, kind of like the way a legitimate IT help desk at a business might help when we, we can't get into our emails or we're having problems formatting a document. So they, they use the consumer, the victim, to actually give access to their computers. It could be a phone call, it could be a pop-up, either way. But they need the, the consumer's kind of help, so to speak, to then further access the computers. Yeah, so they're like visiting a website, the consumer, and they like click on a link and it pops up saying, oh, your computer's been affected, call this number, and that's how they get them. They can, they, they can come in a variety of ways. We're only limited, uh, limited by the creativities of these scammers who are, you know, always looking to evolve new ways of trying to, um, trying to dupe consumers. Let's be clear, these are professional con artists. There are schools, scammer schools, where people are learning how to build a better scam, and that's why we are increasing resources and expanding our networks so we can not only keep up, but we can get ahead of these fraudsters. So last year you had, I think, 200 defendants. This year you have 260. At what point do you hope the numbers actually go down because you're deterring people from engaging in this sort of conduct? <laughs> no. <laughs> Thanks. No, I think our goal is to have zero crime and zero elder fraud. And I think it's what's difficult about the numbers is we understand this is an underreported crime, and we're hoping that today, with all of your help to get the word out, that victims should come forward and report. We hear so often that victors are, victims are ashamed, they're embarrassed, they feel gullible, they, they, and they just feel like they can't tell someone, and so instead they suffer in silence, and they're alone, and they're in silos, and that leads to further problems. We want to encourage people to report so we can fully understand the scope of the problem, and then from there, we can measure our, our successes. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit more about the outreach you're doing to try to reach more people to warn them about uh, what you say is a growing problem? Yes, and this is an all-out effort. So just last year, the Attorney General named an Elder Justice Coordinator in every single U.S. Attorney's Office. We have 93 Elder Justice Coordinators around the country. And they are kind of quarterbacking, for lack of a better word, the Elder Justice response in their local community. Because we realize this is a national problem, but it's going to be a local solution. And so together with our senior core partners, with the FTC, with state attorneys general, with can the local um, community engagement, they're going out to senior centers and YMCAs and faith-based organizations and fairs and anywhere that seniors are gathering to warn them about the schemes and importantly tell them who to call. Because when you are, we do receive a call, it's important to know where to go for help. So we're trying to work locally to educate folks on the ground there. Can you uh, or can one of you address a little bit more about what the Attorney General mentioned about outreach to uh, tech companies and how tech companies can be uh, of use in combating these schemes? Because while it, it might be good to go to fairs, it probably is. It seems like if the schemes are being perpetrated online, there's probably a way to try to leverage some of the people who are already online to try to crack down or discourage this activity. That's right, and I believe we'll have a readout later this afternoon that might answer that question more fully general terms what, what the what the effort is or how cooperative people have been I think that'll be better addressed this afternoon after the readout Catherine. what kind of cooperation are you getting from the Canadians in terms of extraditing a lot of these suspects because the boiler rooms have been operating north of the border for at least two decades based on our report Yes, that's a, a great question. I mentioned a cooperation from India, and we're certainly grateful for our international partners, and that certainly was not meant to exclude any others who have been very strong allies in this effort and who also recognize, one, their citizens are being victimized too. Let's be clear, this problem is not limited to America. And two, realize that anyone who is trying to defraud and exploit a senior that's despicable and that that person should be brought to justice and we have wonderful partnerships with our Canadian counterparts and uh, look forward to continuing to expand that relationship in the upcoming year. 
In two-thirds of cases, financial institutions do not report uh, exploitation of elders. So what carrots and sticks are you using to get financial institutions to help you combat this? Well, certainly the Senior Safe Act was a wonderful first step. And the Senior Safe Act allows for additional reporting and encourages that. And certainly as part of the outreach efforts, is a question one of your colleagues asked, we are reaching out to financial institutions to educate them on what are the signs. How do you know when someone might be the victim of fraud so that they are better equipped and engaged to be able to report it? For the unwitting money mules, which I imagine there's a fairly large percentage of you are saying don't know what they're doing or don't understand that they're working for fraudsters, what is the Bureau's role? Maybe this is a question for the Deputy Director. What do you do when you encounter them? Do you just give them a stern warning? And yeah, so we, first off, um, I want to come back to Dell's question in just a minute, and, and I think there's another component to that. Uh, with the unwitting and the witting money mules, we will frequently issue money mule warning letters. Uh, we have issued a, a very significant number of those this year, and that is to tell them, uh, be careful what you're doing. We will also talk to them both as victims, if they're unwitting, potentially, but also the witting, we will talk to them as potential subjects. Uh, a lot of it goes back to the educational component of understanding what is going on here. So if I could move quickly to Dell's question, I thought it was a good question. We can stand up here and continue this work through next year and talk about all the enforcement efforts that go on continually. But I think another component and the reason for this is not just to show what your government is doing for you through all the agencies uh, to protect our elderly, but it's also to educate. And I think we all have a responsibility to educate all our elderly population. As part of that, you think about it cradle to grave, when we were all born, our parents were our first champions, and we needed them. Today, they need us, and we need to be thoughtful about that and how we help them educate them, both personally and professionally through groups like this. But also, we need to continue to ensure um, that we look out for those that do not have children that are there to educate them and to help them. That is a big part of this. And, I think that's an incredibly important part of this story, not just the enforcement aspect, but the educational aspect. Any more questions? Matt, I think you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.